In the Gospel today, we hear about ten poor lepers coming to our Lord for help. They had heard that our Lord had the power to work miracles, and they wanted to approach Him, but they, they couldn't come close to Him when He was surrounded by other people, because the law didn't let them get close to others in order to prevent um, the contagion. So they cried out to Him from a distance and asked for His mercy. They spoke to him with a very short and humble prayer. All they said was, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. That is exactly the sort of prayer that that our Lord loves to hear. And he was moved with compassion, and he told them to go and show themselves to the priests, and they would be cured. Our Lord told them to go to the priests, and, and the fathers of the church say that This shows us how we should go and show our souls to the priest that we have fallen into sin and we have a spiritual disease in our soul. And and by a spiritual disease, I mean any sort of sin. Sin is any kind of voluntary offense against the law of God. There are two kinds of sin. There's venial sin and mortal sin. And there's evidence of this in Scripture contrary to what the Protestants say, who say that all sins are pretty much the same. In Scripture, some sins are compared to to a camel, and other sins are compared to a gnat, a huge disproportion there. Uh, Some sins are compared to a beam of wood, and others are compared to a speck of dust in someone's eye. In one place in Scripture, it says that a just man falls into sin seven times every day, And in other parts of Scripture, it talks about sins that are odious and abominable in the sight of God and that exclude us from an inheritance in the kingdom of heaven. So these are two very different categories. And that's where we get our belief in mortal and venial sin. Mortal sin kills the soul of the sinner. It it takes away the life of grace. It makes him deserve eternal damnation which is like a perpetual death. And venial sin is a slight offense. It's a a small breach of God's law. And it's much easier to get forgiveness for that. But, of course, every sin is evil in itself. It's an offense against the infinite goodness of God. And, of course, no number of venial sins can ever combine to become a mortal sin. But nevertheless... The more venial sins we commit, the easier it becomes for us to commit a mortal sin. And this is just like a lot of other things in life, that a lot of small things prepare the way for something much bigger. Like a, a little spark or a tiny piece of, of burning ash, like a, like a burning cigarette, for example, can burn down an entire forest. It happens in California all the time. Or a little bit of sickness that we have, if we don't take care of it, we can become worse and worse until we get very ill. And we see this happening in Scripture many times. We see Cain being jealous of his brother Abel, and he didn't resist that temptation, and it became worse and worse until he committed the first murder. Or we see Judas was avaricious at first, and he didn't resist that temptation until finally he betrayed our Lord to his death. But if venial sin is something so dangerous for our souls, mortal sin is far more serious. It's the greatest evil in the entire world. It's a complete rejection of God, God who is infinite good. Mortal sin is truly the most evil and the most destructive, the most abominable thing there is, not only to God himself, but to the person who commits it. It's something that we should be afraid of more than anything else. Mortal sin directly attacks God's infinite goodness. It abuses his mercy. It it, it defies his justice. It provokes his anger. When someone commits a mortal sin, it's like they're raising their hand towards God and and declaring war against him and attacking him. And if the person committing serious sin is, is Catholic, 
then they're committing you. It's, it's even worse because that the sinner is, is violating the vows of his baptism. He's turning away from God and turning towards the devil, which he, he promised not to do in his baptism. Someone who commits mortal sin repays the goodness of, of his heavenly Father with the worst ingratitude. We've all received graces and, and blessings from God so numerous, we, we could never even, even count them, never even imagine how many we've received. But someone who commits mortal sin shows the worst possible ingratitude for everything that he has received from God and, in fact, crucifies our Lord again. With every mortal sin, a person turns his back on his best friend and rejects his merciful Redeemer. The sinner leaves his heavenly Father to feed on garbage like the prodigal son. He trades, he trades heaven for, for this earth and ultimately for hell. And in a way, it's like he sells his soul to the devil and in exchange... All he gets is, is a very brief enjoyment or a small amount of material possessions. And he puts, he puts these things on the altar of his heart where he's supposed to love God and worship him above everything else. He worships the things of this world instead of God. And it's no wonder that we've seen terrible punishments, even in this world, inflicted on people that commit serious sin. We see the, the flood that wiped out almost the entire human race. We saw the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone. And many other examples in scripture of the outrage that God has towards people who commit mortal sin. It only took one mortal sin to close the gates of heaven against the human race for 4,000 years and to take away from us all of the preternatural gifts and even sanctifying grace that God created Adam with. And in order to make reparation for that sin and for all of our other sins, our Lord suffered the most terrible death on the cross. When he could have atoned for all the sins of mankind with only a little bit of suffering, but if our Lord had atoned for our sins with only a very small sacrifice, that would have made us think that mortal sin is not all that big of a deal. And if we look at the punishment that, that God meets out towards people that commit mortal sin, that also gives us an idea of how terrible it is. If God, who is infinitely merciful and infinitely good and loving, has to condemn someone to eternal fire for even one mortal sin, then it must be something evil beyond anything that we can imagine. But that's what our faith teaches us, that someone who dies with even a single mortal sin on his soul will suffer eternal damnation, what scripture calls the second death, and will be entombed in an ocean of fire. But in a way, this is only a continuation of the person's condition in this life. Because when someone commits a mortal sin, their soul is already dead in this life. Because it doesn't have the life of grace. And so St. Augustine says that someone in a state of mortal sin is, is carrying around a corpse inside of him wherever he goes. Because his soul is dead even while his body is alive. His soul is, is entombed in his body. And he's walking around in the constant and immediate danger of being buried in hell forever. It's tragic to see how people are always so careful to protect their body from, from any possible injury or, or danger, and especially from death, while the whole time they not only put their souls in serious danger, but they even commit even more sins and expose themselves to the risk of hell. But think about what a person loses even in this life when he commits mortal sin. He loses sanctifying grace. 
Someone in, in the state of grace is, is the object of God's love. He's, he's, he's God's friend. He's a temple of the Holy Ghost. His soul is filled with, with the graces and, and the blessings of heaven. And it's, it's beautiful with merit and virtue. His soul is full of hope and full of the, the love of God, hope and charity and faith. But if someone commits a mortal sin, he loses those things except faith, and it, he becomes instead like a sewer full of disgusting rottenness and evil. He loses all the beauty that his soul had and all the merit that he had acquired over the course of his life. He becomes completely wretched and miserable. So we should be afraid of this, and we should be resolved Never to commit a mortal sin, no matter what, no matter what inconvenience or pain we have to go through to avoid it. We should never be like those people who, who continue for months or even years at a time, committing mortal sins all the time and remaining in the state of sin. And every time people in the state of sin close their eyes to go to sleep at night, they don't know if they'll ever open them again. They don't know whether... The next time they open their eyes will be the last time and they will see themselves surrounded by the terrors of the demons and the unquenchable fire. St. Thomas Aquinas said that he can't even imagine how a Christian can go to sleep at night or even laugh and have fun while his conscience knows he's in mortal sin because he has this, this terrible doom constantly hanging over him and separated by just the smallest accident or health problem. We should think about the vast number of people that die suddenly every day in the midst of their sins and end up in hell without any more chances to repent. We shouldn't put off our repentance to some vague time in the future or to the end of our life. That's actually the most difficult time in life to repent even if we have our, our, our faculties with us. A lot of people die very suddenly. But even in the best case scenario, we might not have the, the ability to confess our sins before we die. And in any case, St. Augustine says that the repentance late in life is very rarely sincere and fruitful because people die the way they live. St. Bernard says that, that when a tree falls over, it usually falls in the direction where it has the most branches because that's where there's the most weight pulling it down. So most people will fall, meaning they'll die, in the direction where they have the most actions. If they have more acts of virtue than sin, they'll probably die virtuously. And if they have more sins than acts of virtue, Chances are they'll die in the state of sin. There's a saying that, that we all die a little bit every day, and it's true. So we should think, are we dying well today or badly? And if we're dying badly, let us imitate the ten lepers and cry out to our Lord, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And then let us do what he says and go and show our souls to the priest and be healed of our, of our sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.